Now it's my uh, distinct pleasure and high honor to introduce uh, Karen Ross. Uh, Karen Ross was appointed Secretary of the California Department of Food and Agriculture nearly six years ago by Governor Edmund G. Brown, Jr. I want to make a note here, particularly about the governor. Um, you know, when we started this series, um, we could have started this series, and, and, um, but the, not only this governor, but the prior governor, Schwarzenegger, made an investment in the San Joaquin Valley to the San Joaquin Valley Partnership, and that was continued with Governor Brown. And we have had many department heads here from the Sacramento who came down to the valley to talk about these topics over the years. And I just want to acknowledge his effort and his willingness to uh, really send the message to his staff that, hey, we're doing something here in the Valley, let's go out and support that. So no matter what your party affiliation is, it's really been noticed down here where we were able to get some of the best and brightest, and another one of those is Karen Ross today. Um, Secretary Ross has deep leadership experience in agricultural issues nationally, internationally, and here in California. Prior to joining the department, Secretary Ross was Chief of Staff of, of U.S. Agricultural Sec Secretary Tom Velasic a position she accepted in 2009. Earlier in her career, she served as president of the California Association of Wine, Gro Wine Grape Growers from 1996 to 2009, and as vice president of the Agricultural Council of California from 1989 to 1996. Please welcome Karen Ross. Good morning. So Frank, thank you for putting in a plug for the San Joaquin Valley Partnership. That was definitely on my list of assets that we have and it's done some remarkable work and I'm really proud to be a member of that. And I was especially proud to be one of the strongest advocates along with my good friend Diana Dooley, a Valley girl, that's what the governor refers to Diana as the Valley girl, um, of really articulating how important it is um, in this region in particular, to have an organization like that that brings together state government, local government, and the private sector to think strategically and really reinforce a lot of the work that was done um, when the California Economic Summits started. And for me, watching the work that has been done to bring people together to really focus on our assets in a positive way and deploy our energy to getting money and resources to the valley. I think the, one of the best examples, quite frankly, is what's happening in education in the valley. Some of the early experiments, high school all the way through the UC system. I am so impressed by the passion and the energy and the vision that's happening to make sure that the youth of our valley know that there is hope and opportunity and tremendous, tremendous assets that are being invested in them for this place. So why is this place so important? You know, it's really easy to take for granted what we do here in the Valley. It's easy to take it for granted because we're so used to facing challenge and using innovation and bringing people together and just get past that. And yet, when people hear the numbers, it says something to them. Out of this valley, we have eight of the top 10 ag-producing counties in the country. We produce 14 products that aren't grown anyplace else. We have 20% of the milk, most of it coming from this valley. We produce a third of the vegetables and two-thirds of the fruits and tree nuts that go here and around the world. We have the largest number of farmers markets and community supported agricultural subscriptions in this state than any other state, but we also ship product to 167 countries. We represent 14% of all agricultural exports, but what really those numbers don't do is tell the story about how we do it. California is a place like no other, and I would say that's because of what we grow and how we grow it. We have done more with less water, sometimes willingly, sometimes not so much. 
But the fact is, when I moved to this state 30 years ago, we were in the midst of a seven-year drought. Tremendous change has happened as a result of that. Not enough investment, probably, but change has happened. We're doing exactly what all the policymakers said to do over 30 years ago, higher value crops. When I came to this state, we had 1.4 million acres of cotton. Today, we have less than 250,000 acres. When I came to this state, we had about 400,000 acres of almonds. We have a million acres of almond trees. That's value, and guess what that has represented? Exactly what economists love. We're using every drop to produce the best economic return. We're using 8% less applied water, and the economic value of the water that we're using per acre foot has increased 96.6%, and we're producing more food, 57% more in yields. Those are remarkable numbers that happen because people are willing to constantly adapt, deploy technology, and think carefully about every input that they're using. Well, we know the challenges before us. I wanted to start with something positive because it's really hard lately working with my good friend Don Cameron down here to stay positive. We just spent, and by the way, Don is a farmer, but he's usually in meetings like this because he was in a meeting with me most of the day yesterday. When I think about the challenges before us, it is especially important that we welcome and embrace new faces and new perspectives to help us solve these problems. So we need the energy and the creativity that comes from that. So let me start through my long list of challenges that we have and why I believe we can turn them into opportunities. First of all, if public policymakers really thought about what we have in this valley and the connections that that represents, would they willingly let that go? No, they wouldn't. So first and foremost, we all have to think about how we communicate and how we embrace diversity and different perspectives to have them understand what we're doing for so many people that will never see us or what we do but also that we understand their perspective and understand how we can engage with them. So the art of communication is more important today than it ever has been. And it doesn't, as important as social media is, nothing will ever replace building the relationships. So William, thank you so much for mentioning these are the kinds of conferences that build relationships that hopefully we take out to communities up and down the state and that we bring those lawmakers to this region. So the art of communication in multiple languages has never been more important. You all have a passion for what you do. There's nothing better than to share a passion with others who don't get exposed to what we do, but to also listen to what they do to make California a place like no other. When I think about water, and how could we not think about water? How can we continue to do what we do using every drop as carefully as we possibly can, applying it at precisely the right time, using a lot of technology to help inform those kinds of decisions? We know that with the changes that are happening to account for environmental impacts of our big systems, that that's taking water that we used to take for granted out of the system or putting it into the system at a completely different time. How do we work with the regulators? How do we work with the environmental advocates to be able to understand how we can precisely use those drops of water for fish and for farming and for drinking water and for local economies? I believe we are at a point in time with the FLOWS proposals to show people a new and better way of resolving our water problems so that we can meet those co-benefits and those equally compelling beneficial uses. We have the science and technology. It's available to us. We just need to come together to figure it out and to understand that just releasing more water may not be the answer in and of itself, and I would suggest that it's not. 
It is understanding the precise use of water for fish, just as we do the precise amount of water to grow our crops. So we have that coming at the same time as I'm going to throw all the initials at you, the Sustainable Groundwater Management Act, a game changer. There is no doubt about it. The speculation of acres that may need to be fallowed are as high as 2 million acres. <clears throat> a lot of the experts are saying an additional 500,000 acres. But if it's your acres and your lifestyle and your drinking water, that's a lot different than just using gross numbers. And that's what gets lost in a lot of these discussions is the personal impact, the community impact, the challenge of wanting to continue to work together when it feels like we don't have those opportunities. But on the flip side of that, thinking about what's beneath our feet, and I will talk about soils in a minute. Last week I saw a great presentation. Helen Dahlke did some early work several years ago. She had already mapped out the soils of the state and identified up to a million acres of soils that are most suitable for recharge on the farm, as well as larger retention ponds that irrigation districts might use. Here's one of the early pioneers, Don Cameron, who probably, when he first started flooding his vineyards at the wrong time of the year, his neighbors probably raised their eyebrows and went, there goes Don, what's he up to now? But guess what? This year, the almond growers, their board, is partnering with Sustainable Conservation to actually measure what the recharge impacts are and making sure that we understand that we can do it safely without impacting already impacted groundwater basins with nitrates or other pesticide issues. Tremendous opportunities. They have identified that all of our reservoirs, and we've got 40 of them about in this state, can store at their maximum 42 million acre feet of water. Underground storage capacity is 140 million acre feet. It's understanding the most efficient way using technology and good old common sense, how do we put water into the ground so that we continue to have that in our bank account to get us through drought and all the other things that we need it for. We also have irrigated ag land program. And Darren, I'm sure we'll talk a little bit about that. That has come about because we need to better fertilize our crops, meaning more efficiently doing exactly, again, the exact amount at exactly the right time, the right place with the right product. And we've made tremendous improvements. But the practices that we've had, that which were best practices at the time, have created a nitrate problem in groundwater. In a state as wealthy and as special as California, we should not have whole communities that are not able to drink the water from their tap. And people are stepping up to do the right thing, to find replacement water. And I would suggest that, again, there are tremendous opportunities for us working together to take this issue off our table so that we can focus on the longer term needs of water availability and water quality. The Irrigated Ag Land Program is requiring people to do nutrient management plans. It's requiring people to certify those plans. There's a lot of specialists that are needed in our future. There's no doubt about it. We think about soil, and a lot of attention is being played to soil because last year, 2015, was the International Year of Soils. And it was the year that Governor Brown proposed the Healthy Soils Initiative, which people were very excited about. But unfortunately, the legislature couldn't approve the expenditure plan. We now have the first ever statewide Healthy Soils Initiative, which has $7.5 million in funding to work with farmers as part of the solution to climate change. How do we sequester carbon? How do we become carbon farmers to improve the health of our soils, the holding capacity of our soils with more organic matter, to really be more resilient? We know that when we increase carbon and organic matter in our soils, we increase the water holding capacity by 20%. 
Now, I know a little bit about this because I own a farm with my brother in western Nebraska where I grew up. Dry land farming, feed grains and cattle, not exactly the most lucrative business in the world to be in, but boy, it sure does make me appreciate what we have here in California even better. My brother started doing a number of these practices over a decade ago, and those are the fields that are most resilient to drought. They are healthier. He talks about the liveliness of his soil, the springiness of his soils. Farmers are the solution to helping us address climate change by preserving ag land and by investing in soil health, by partnering with farmers. We have so much that we can do. Thank you. We also know that with climate change, we have tremendous opportunities on the farm producing renewable energy. And I'm not just talking about solar panels. I'm talking about biomass. We now have almost 4 million acres of permanent crops of this state. That's 4 million of our 9 million acres of irrigated ag land in trees and vines. That's a lot of prunings on an annual basis. It's an ongoing cycle of replacement. We know that we've lost a lot of opportunities to convert that biomass. But with the combination of 66 million acres of dead trees and another 59 million acres of dying trees, we know that we have to do something to address biomass. But how do we not treat it as a waste? How do we treat it as a resource that can be used for renewable energy purposes? I'm most excited, and I grew up, you know, I grew up in the eastern part of the state is, is corn country in Nebraska, always big about the next generation of biofuels is just around the corner. I've been hearing that for 40 years, but there are people that are doing amazing things, doing cellulosic breakdown to be able to turn woody biomass into transportation fuels. Tremendous, tremendous opportunity for renewable natural gas from our dairies with that solid waste and from converting biomass into energy for transportation fuels. Tremendous opportunities. Again, ag is in the middle of the solution set there. I have a long list here. What else do I have? Ah. So let me talk about something as mundane as pest management, because that's a core function of the Department of Food and Agriculture. We know that as the economy improves, we get more visitors and tourists, and we get a lot more commerce going through our state. Over 50% of what arrives in our ports is destined to other states, but a lot of that brings bugs with it that we don't want. I hate it when I'm the first state to get a certain invasive pest. I will tell you that running those eradication programs is getting more and more tenuous because we tend to have to run those programs in urban areas. They do not appreciate the intrusiveness of my staff knocking on their door for access to their backyard to treat Japanese beetle up to four times and over a multi-year period of time. Thinking about how well, we can use technology to better scan, using x-ray technology to better scan cargo coming into the state, trucks coming into our state, to actually find the critters that we don't want. Excluding them is the most environmentally smart thing that we can do. But also being able to rapidly respond with the softest use chemicals possible to eradicate it while it's small, small, small is the smartest thing we can do. We do not want the Asian citrus salad vectoring, vectoring Wang Long Bing and wiping out our citrus the way it has in Florida. We've proven how effective we can be isolating the glass wing sharpshooter to prevent the spread of Pierce's disease. We need technology, cutting edge science to make sure that we can stay on top of that. When I think about the San Joaquin Valley and the opportunities in the future, I'm glad that I have seen over the last decade people embrace what we excel at, agriculture, and thinking about how do we add value to what we grow here. The manufacturing initiative, Ag Plus in the Valley, is really bringing people together and is constantly focused on workforce development, 
what are the jobs in food processing and ag manufacturing of the future, and how are we working with high schools, community colleges, the CSU system, and the UC system to make sure that our human capital, the thing that we have that is better than any place in the world, I would argue, is ready and equipped and always one step ahead of what our needs are, of how we can add more value, create more jobs, and be the innovators of the next great thing in food processing, in food packaging, in flavor and nutrition. What is it that we can do, and how do we take the assets of the Valley, starting with our human capital, to make that work? I am optimistic about agriculture. Don Cameron, I am. It's hard. All of those things that I've talked about are layers of regulation that in many ways we didn't have 15 years ago. And now we do. How do we deploy what's necessary to be in compliance to make sure that we are dri driving those regulations in a way that help agriculture be more efficient, that are part of our brand, Grow California, by California, you know, the rest of the world looks at that brand and it means to them reliability, safety, and quality. But that's partly because they know embedded in that is this ability to do it in the way that we do it and that we have a regulatory system that really does mean something. I don't necessarily like competing for Chinese markets because us, I'm the safest one. But that is what it means. It is valuable. California Grown is a valuable brand. What you all do in that to give that the bone structure that it needs cannot be dismissed. So I think that if we work together, we can engage our regulators, and I would be one of those, but I'm also your advocate. Um, I honestly think that we can solve these problems and show people a better way of doing it. It's not about saying no, it's about saying, yes, here's an alternative that's smarter, more efficient, and will get the job done better. That's what we do when we come to conferences like that. We become the problem solvers. We are identifying the solution set. We're willing to be the trials to show that it can work. But the most important thing we can do is engage those people by saying, you've got a problem. I've got the solution. Farmers are the best innovators that I know. I think it's great we've got Silicon Valley. I think it's 100 times better that we've got the San Joaquin Valley and all the resources that we have to deploy to be the problem solvers for today, for the rest of the 21st century, and to borrow a phrase from the Almond Board of California, the agronomic center for the 22nd century. That century, that's thinking long term, far beyond when I will be around. But I know that it will start because of people like you who are willing to spend a day together to look at the challenges and figure out what are the opportunities in those challenges. You're one of those, and I'm looking forward to your comments. Thank you very much. I'm happy to take questions or criticisms, OK? No? I'll Come around on. Applause, Throw it at me. Questions? I appreciate the great extent of service. I appreciate the fact that you went to farm. But I think one thing that the state doesn't appreciate is the fact that you can detail very, very finite and excellent monologue exactly how the agricultural industry and the people that work with on a daily basis here in the field, in the dirt, on the ground, have developed these innovative ways to farm, have built this fantastic uh, world uh, image and brand, mm -hmm. and yet our own government uh, is willing to throw that in the trash can and smash this industry uh, by declaring war against the farmer. Mm -hmm. And uh, I just really uh, think that we need to be more real about our options is that really if, if, if farmers in this industry, we need to take back our government and take it away from these political hacks who think they can control and run an industry 
greater and much bigger than they are. And what gave them the, the platform to run their campaigns on, the platform for them to take control and get off, to get into office from, and for them to turn on us like that, I, I really, I really don't respect it at all. And I, and I think it's a, it's, it's one of those first steps where if you're going to have an emergency proclamation and you're going to use those emergency proclamations to bend the law and force the uh, regulations down farmers' throats, I think maybe you should, uh, the government should reconsider. Maybe they should uh, reconsider forcing those restrictions down uh, environmentalists' throats first and let us get better ground, get, let us get higher ground so we can stabilize our, our, our uh, infrastructure and prepare for this prepare for this change, this transition. Because uh, we did everything that was asked of us when we put micro sprinklers and drip irrigation and lowered, lowered the, uh, and, and produced better crops on less water, but at the same time, we did not, not unknowingly sacrifice our groundwater recharge supply by eliminating flood irrigation. And, and I think that people need to know the truth about that. Uh, you know, we basically took the risk of cutting our own throats depending on the government to be there for us, to give us surface water uh, on, when, when we agreed to, to uh, put in um, uh, these drip and micro-irrigation systems to use less water, and now we're, we'll be in the ones that are brunt of the suffering. I, I completely, I completely, it, it, it sounds hollow for me to stand and say I completely get what you're saying. And I think that one of the things that's happening as a result of Sigma is looking at we need conjunctive use models that allow flooding in winter time. Um, one of the most interesting things that have come out the, out of the early trials that Helen has been running is flooding the best soils, and they are alfalfa fields, and flooding it in the winter time so that it's recharging, it's clean recharge because as we know, alfalfa is nitrogen fixing, uses very few pesticides. So flooding it in the winter time is an ideal time for, for creating that recharge so that we have it to use in the summertime. One of the, one of the things that's facing us right now, and this is the complication of our big massive water system, is you have a federal government piece, you have a state government piece, and then you have these thousands of irrigation district pieces and the local government piece is getting everybody to work together and especially engaging folks who, quite frankly, are 3,000 miles away from here. So I, I, we do need to do flood. It's what time of the year. It may change the time of the year so that you can continue because your crop quality is better. The yields have improved. Being able to recharge on a constant basis and intentionally recharging throughout the year at those times when we get peak storms or winter time when we're not drawing on other resources is exactly the kind of thing that people like Don and a lot of folks are spending a lot of time on to show how we can do that so that we have conjunctive use models that work for you. Any other questions? Good. Yes, we can back Mm -hmm. And I was wondering if this was a summary from a report that Davis produced when they were hired by the Department of Water Resources to create this analysis. And the one thing that surprises me is it kind of paints with a broad brush best management practices between the Salinas Valley, which is produce and highly mm -hmm. Analysis and summary that would 
So I don't, Tom, is that your study or is that the one from several years ago? So Dr. Tomish will, yeah. is here today to talk about that. And, and that is one of the challenges for regulators is the diversity we have. That's our strength, but it also makes it very challenging. And so the best management practices are on a per crop basis, but the groundwater basin itself has to be characterized in some way. So that, that is one of the challenges, but that's also why until the state board was petitioned on a challenge of the irrigated ag lands program, the irrigated ag lands program in the Central Valley looks so different from the one in the Salinas Valley. And the challenge that Darren and his colleagues have is still allowing for that, those regional differences, and, but still attacking the problem, which is impacted groundwater basins, and trying not to do citrus, you must do the same as, or lettuce, you must do the same as. Our, our FREP program, which is the Fertilizer Research Education Program, over the last 15 years, we've invested almost 200 projects, $15 million. We now have a searchable database that can show you best practices that are, are constantly being updated by crop. We have uh, about 40 crops in there, so it represents over 75% of the production in the state because we recognize that what works for citrus works for citrus and the soils that you're growing that citrus crop on, which also have a lot of differences. I think, Tom, I don't know if that is the topic of your discussion here, Tom? It's broader, but I certainly will. Well, she'll get into it. Yeah. yeah. So, so I'm going to leave the science. I was an English major, so I'm going to leave that. To <laughs> <laughs> but I have a really good science advisor. Yes. Yes. I, I just, you know, for the record, uh -huh. I, I just can't agree or accept that the Bureau of Land Management Yeah, that, that's important. The other thing is that the impacts on our groundwater are part of it, a big part of it is legacy from 50 years ago, not today. So it's stopping any further impacts now, which our best practices do do. But then there's still the issue of that impacted basin and like who, who gets to help fix the legacy problem? That's a huge challenge and it's a costly one to face. Well, I, I'm all for the broadest population possible helping to solve this problem. <laughs> Not to get too far into the advocacy part, don't tell anybody on me, Darren. Okay. Oh, I'm getting to across the stage. Yes. So there's been a over 10 year stakeholder process um, here in the Central Valley, this Central Valley Salts stakeholder process, which is coming up with some solution sets. It will be part, it will be proposed to the Central Valley Regional Water Quality Control Board before the end of the year. And hopefully something will be adopted in 2017 or 2018. With regard to remediation of the soils, I agree. I mean, first of all, let us please ask Mother Nature to give us lots of rain so we can flush those salts. But we also, Don was part of a delegation that went with me to the Netherlands looking at saline agriculture and crops that can be grown and understanding plant breeding, how we're equipped to have crops that can grow with higher salinity soils, but also the opportunities to treat brackish water uh, and in the interior and the things that we can do with plants that will actually, that's my dream, plants will actually uptake the salts. So that's the long-term solution is really looking at plant breeding and we saw some pretty amazing work that's happening both in the Netherlands and then in Israel this year 
of people that are looking specifically at plants that could be a part of the remediation of that. We don't have any short-term solutions right now other than CV Salts providing a basin plan amendment and some funding to address it, but there's not a short-term fix on that one. But I agree, we will lose the capacity of this fabulous, unique, growing region if we don't find some solutions. So we really need our friends in research and extension to help us with some solutions. And community colleges, of course. I'm a big fan of community colleges. All right.